Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and unless you've been living under a space rock, you'll know that Mars Insight successfully launched last night, which means uh, this video is a little late. The question I have been asked is why did it launch from Vandenberg when every single other Mars mission that NASA has launched has launched out of Florida? And the short answer is that when the original trajectory was planned, it would have required a launch from Florida to go into a relatively high inclination orbit and that lessened the advantage of launching out of Florida. So, given the option, ULA decided that it would be better to launch from Vandenberg on the west coast because far fewer rockets launched from there. That would have meant that they would have more room in the schedule if there were issues with having to scrub and reschedule the launch. And as it happened, they did have to reschedule the launch because originally Mars InSight was scheduled to launch in 2016. Unfortunately, a spacecraft problem caused them to miss their launch window, and so two years later they finally got to go. But look, the short answer is only for those people that make snarky comments about me taking forever to get to the point. The proper answer involves a little more detailed discussion of orbital mechanics, which is exactly why smart people like you come here to listen to me ramble on about this stuff. So, here is an example of a manoeuvre in Kerbal Space Program. Now, the spacecraft is sitting in a Kerbin-like orbit, same distance from uh, the Sun, but it is not in orbit around Kerbin. Now, I can adjust my uh, manoeuvre node, I can adjust three vectors, the prograde, radial and normal, and this will let me define uh, an impulse that I will give using the rocket engines that will carry it into an orbit that will eventually intersect this planet. Now, this orbit is only taking account of the gravity of the Sun. In real cases, you would actually have to launch into low Earth orbit, and then you would, of course, perform an escape burn from there. So let's look at this spacecraft. It's sitting in a parking orbit around the equator of Kerbin, and about uh, seven minutes from now, it's going to perform an escape burn, which will accelerate its orbital velocity fast enough that it starts to rise up. And as it rises up, Kerbin continues to affect it, but as it gets further and further away, the trajectory becomes straighter and straighter. Eventually, it moves out of the sphere of influence of Kerbin into the sphere of influence of the Sun, and this orbit carries it around to Duna. Now, this this uh, transfer, this is a hyperbolic orbit, but as this thing gets straighter and straighter, this is what we call the launch asymptote. An asymptote is basically a straight line that a curve tends towards as it reaches infinity. Now, it's not quite infinity, but for our purposes, it's close enough. So yeah, this is called the launch asymptote in as astro navigation, uh, you know, terminology. And you can measure this coordinate relative to the Earth. You can imagine that this draws a point on the sky relative to the parent body. So this is a point in the sky, and you can give it a coordinate like a point in the sky. So relative to the planet's equator, you can use a declination, which is, uh, you know, positive for above the equator and negative below the equator. And then you can give it a right ascension, which is an angular distance relative to some fixed uh, angle you know, in the sky. And of course, to make it a proper three-dimensional vector, you then need to add a velocity and infinity. And then when you combine that with the power of orbital mechanics, you can take your initial manoeuvre node defined by the prograde, radial and normal vectors and translate that back into this declination, right ascension and the velocity at infinity. And you'll notice here that I actually made a bit of a mistake. I had to perform a bit of a plane change here. It took 117 meters per second to fix that. Now, if you're doing this for real, obviously you want to have your target orbit be perfectly aligned so that you only need to perform a prograde burn. Because for a given initial orbit, all the possible launch asymptotes end up in a plane defined by the orbit. Furthermore, the declinations of these launch asymptotes are basically plus or minus the inclination of the orbit. So for a 30 degree inclination orbit, you can't get a declination greater than 30 degrees. And I'm sure by now you know that the US has two launch sites because Kennedy on the East Coast is able to hit a range of launch inclinations which allow it to reach things like the space station, whereas Vandenberg on the West Coast is able to go all the way up to polar orbits so they can launch those spy satellites that cover the entire Earth. So in theory, if you came up with an interplanetary mission where the launch required a very high launch asymptote, it would only be reachable from Vandenberg.
Now that's not quite what happened here because back when the original mission was designed, the maximal launch asym asymptote was something like minus 51 degrees, so it was still technically achievable from Florida. The spacecraft could have in theory been launched onto a 51 degree inclination orbit and hit that launch asymptote. In fact, it would have been slightly more efficient because the rocket gets a bit of a boost from the rotation of the Earth, and this boost is proportional to the cosine of the inclination of the orbit. But the relatively high inclination of the parking orbit meant that the difference between the two sites was very small, less than 100 meters per second, which, if you could handle it on the same rocket, meant that you might as well choose Vandenberg so that you could get a much clearer launch schedule. Of course, the 2016 launch never happened, and the same wasn't quite as true for the 2018 opportunity, but by that point, they had kind of committed to Vandenberg, and uh, you know, it didn't really make that much difference to them. One of the big reasons that the launch azimuth angle can change so much over time is that the Earth, unlike Kerbin, has its polar axis out of alignment with its orbital plane. So during the autumn, the North Pole is actually kind of leaning forwards into the direction of the Earth's motion. And during the spring, the Earth's North Pole tends to be pointing backwards along its orbit. And even though Earth and Mars's orbits only differ by about two degrees of inclination, because the velocity of departure has to be measured in the reference frame of the Earth, it can actually be quite a high inclination uh, departure. And a good example of this is the asteroid Bennu, which Osiris Rex is chaining. Bennu is inclined 6 degrees to the Earth's orbit, so that when it crosses the Earth's orbit, it's actually going vertically at about 3 kilometers per second. Now, Osiris Rex decided to use a gravity assist to get there instead. If you remember, it launched a year before its initial gravity assist, made some mid-course corrections, and then came back to Earth going much faster over the South Pole, which then flipped it up into the target orbit. And the cool thing is, if you plug these requirements into a trajectory calculating tool, it'll actually tell you the target velocity and everything that they had to achieve through this gravity assist. And these tools, what they're showing you is the way you have to leave the sphere of influence of the Earth. And it doesn't matter if you started inside there or if you got a gravity assist, it's how you leave it. And of course, these tools are just rough approximations compared to the actual work that goes into designing a spacecraft trajectory. And if you look at the paper that they published, I mean, they have to account for everything. It's not like Kerbal Space Program, where you can just throw something into an approximate orbit and make it up with the copious amounts of spare delta V you have. So yeah, look, I'm glad that InSight got away. It's very cool that it launched off the West Coast, and we'd like to see a lot more of those, preferably when the fog isn't happening. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.